your time uh, on these vision series that we've been in. I'm really blessed by them. Last week we heard it a little bit, it did something was the it's the love month because February's love month and it was it was the weekend of uh Amen Praise God uh Valentine's weekend. So I did something on the I want to get back to uh the matter of heart, the matter of heart. And today I want to I want to journey as much as the next 10 minutes will allow. I'm only going to preach about 10, possibly 15 minutes, and then we're going to close. So if I can have your attention for the 10 or 15 more minutes, we can do this together. Uh, I want to talk today. We've been talking, even praise God, about a 2020 vision. Somebody say 2020 vision. 2020. Uh, I want to talk today on the power of a vision. Why vision is so important? Why is it so important? We declare that this year, this year will be the year of double vision. Somebody say double vision. Now, for the first part of these slides, it's just review, so I want to get everybody on the same page. Some of us have seen it for the very first time, but it's really important. We declared that 2020 would be a year of double vision. Somebody say double vision. Double vision. Now, just to bring you up to speed, if you haven't been here, double vision means being able to see, see uh, use your vision in two sectors or two primary areas of your life. Go to the, it's the church vision and personal vision. Church vision and personal vision. Now let me say this, I'm real big, I'm real big that God calls you personally and then he places you in a church. He calls you as a person. You are a person first, you're going to be a person when you die. Amen. Amen. For everything else between is just an experience. Yes. And so he calls you and unloads in your heart, downloads in your spirit as a person what he plans to do. And then he plants you into the church so that he can help you have double vision. So that you can see your role as something bigger than yourself. And so in double vision, uh, and we've been dealing with two scriptures. The first one is Proverbs 29 and 18. Proverbs 29 and 18 says, where there is no vision, vision. People perish. What? People perish. In other words, where there is no vision, people perishing is inevitable. And perishing is not just, amen, praise God, that something bad is going to or tragic is going to happen. But in perhaps what the writer is conveying is that where there is no vision, people get off course. Amen. The, the greatest tragedy of your life is to live your life, come to the end of your life, and hear God says, amen, 20 years ago you got off track and never got on track, got back on track, and everything else you lived in your life was meaningless. The greatest tragedy is just to come to the end of your years and find out that you messed up and you got derailed and when you got back on track, I mean, you switched track and the rest, the last 10 years of your life, God says, I wasn't even involved in because I didn't plan it. Jesus. Life is decision-based. Somebody say decision-based. Decision and you've got to be careful that the decisions you make could impact your future but leave God out. Amen. And so you may end up by living in the wrong neighborhood, driving the wrong car, marrying the wrong person, producing the wrong kids, get to the end of your life and realize everything was wrong. Yeah. And so, the Bible says, without vision, people perish. So every now and then, especially in the early part of every year, it behooves us to sit down long enough and say, God, get in my vision. Show me the vision of my future. You see what? You have to believe that God is all-knowing. And that he knows what's up ahead of you. Secondly, you've got to trust God with your future. Some people trust yourself only you trust God. So you've got your hands involved in your future trying to manipulate it into what you hope God will accept. No, feel bad for a company. Abraham tried that too. And he ended up with the wrong woman producing the wrong children, and that's why there's war in the Middle East right now. Uh huh. And that was the result of somebody trying to help God out, manipulated God into their future. And instead, we have a world crisis on our hands. Secondly, the second scripture we begin to hack on or stay on says, write the vision and make it what? So he that hears it will be able to understand it and run with it. We would pause and adjust these two truths called scriptures or called texts to which we've been building our January and February on. Go to the next slide, sir. 
And so uh, I, we, we've been dealing with these scriptures. And, and, and this year, not only in the Gentile church that is occurring, but the Jews have said that this is the year of the eyes and the mouth. Somebody say double. double. The eyes and the mouth. This is all review. I, I, I taught this back in January. So you can take pictures if you want. Amen. Praise God. Uh, uh, it is the eyes and the mouth. What that means is this is the year you got to watch what you say. Watch your mouth. Come here, if you look at your neighbor real quick, say, watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Say it like you really mean. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Uh, my, my, my mama used to be holler at me, hush. Yes. Is what they used to say to me in school. Shh. Watch your mouth. Because this is the year of the eyes and the mouth. What does that mean? It means that if you can see it in your vision, you must say what you see, which is to declare it. And you shall see it come to pass, which means God is going to decree what you have declared because of what you have seen. Yeah. Somebody put your hand together and praise God. Yeah. Next slide, sir. Amen. This year of 2020 is a year of double vision, which means nothing shall escape your vision. Somebody say, nothing, nothing. shall escape, shall escape. My, vision. my vision. Let me say this, amen, praise God. Whatever you focus on becomes your reality. Whatever you put in your vision becomes a point of contact for your future. Notice that if you, the minute you buy a car, you start to see other cars just like yours. They were always there, but you were blind to it because it wasn't in your vision. What I hear the Holy Spirit say, this is the year I'm going to hijack what you see. I'm going to place and download some stuff in your spirit that you'll be able to see what I have said over your life. I wish I had some praises in here. You've got to hear what God is saying so you can see it. Amen. The Bible says in Joshua, amen, praise God, 3 and 5, sanctify yourself. <laughs> when God brought the children of Israel, amen, praise God, through the wilderness and into their area of promise, he brought them into a territory called Canaan. He said to them, on the Joshua's leadership, he said, sanctify yourself. Why? Because tomorrow I'll get ready to do great things among you. I hear the Holy Ghost. I don't know who God is talking to, but I hear God saying, set apart yourself. Because I'm getting ready to do great things. How many people believe in God for some great things for 2020 and beyond? We use the word beyond as we speak of 2020 because 2020 didn't just start a new year. It started a new cycle called a decade. It started not just a new year, but a new cycle called a new decade. Oh, hallelujah. It means that whatever you do this year, is going to lay a foundation for your next nine years. Oh God, I don't know what your, what your, how old you are. I don't know how old you are, but if you add ten more years to whatever, whatever age you are now, it now determines that what God is laying a foundation for this year is to carry you for the next ten years. Somebody praise God for the vision that He has for our lives for the next ten years. Just look at your neighbor and say, "Watch your mouth." I don't want anybody disturbing my peace. I don't want anybody messing with me because I'm working on the next 10 years of my life and I can't afford for any distractions. I can't afford for anything destructive. By the same token, you've got to be careful what you're doing this year because you're planting seeds for the next 10 years. And so he says to Joshua, tell the people to sanctify. Now, I want to say this, amen, but when we think of sanctify, we think of only fasting and prayer. But sanctify means to set apart. Now, stay with me, this is really important. Set apart, somebody says set apart. So yesterday, when we carved out time, when we left our homes and came here for two or three hours, amen, we were sanctifying ourselves. We were setting ourselves apart. So the Holy Ghost to say, God, paint on the canvas of my mind what my future needs to look like. You cannot have what you cannot see. You cannot be or become what you cannot see. And so yesterday as we set apart time, we were sanctifying ourselves. We were emptying ourselves of ourselves. Say, God, you get the right to write on my mind 
what my future needs to look like. Somebody give a lot of hand praise all over this house. And moving forward with that, you need a personal vision. Somebody say personal vision. You see, if you don't get a personal vision from the Lord for your life, somebody's going to pull up in your life and give you their vision. Let me say, if you don't invest time in sanctifying yourself before God so God can, can rank on the canvas of your life, your personal vision, you're going to end up with somebody else's vision. You see, there are always those who are, amen, praise God, who are pillars in your life. They are supporters. And throughout the day, amen, our young people were identifying people who have been pillars to them and, and, and displaying their lives before us. But then there are caterpillars. Caterpillars just eat away at the very fiber of your life. And you've got to decide if you're going to hang around pillars or you're going to hang around caterpillars. I grew up in the islands and caterpillars had the tendency of blending in so it's hard for you to see. But once you spot them, you have an obligation to remove them immediately. Touch your name and say, watch your mouth. Because it's going to reveal if you're a pillar or a caterpillar. I wish I had somebody in here. Go to the next slide real quick, please. Amen, praise God. I'm not going to be able to get through all this, but maybe I'll get through these. There are six elements to a vision. Six elements to a vision. One, every vision is built on a promise. And that's where you got to sanctify yourself. What is it that God promised me? Sometimes that promise has been over your generation. It was over your mama. Let me say this. Can I pause here for a second? Just, just a minute. Some of us are living out the promise that was made to our mamas and our dads. But they did not fulfill it in their lifetime. And God says, I'm raising up another generation. David desired to build God a house. But that promise was not fulfilled in his lifetime. So God raised up a son. And says, I'm going to let that promise be over your generation. And so how many pray that your children get to live out so you didn't get a chance to live out? How many of you want better for your children and your grandchildren that you were able to achieve or see in your lifetime? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. There's a promise over your life. Now, let me say this. You must discover your personal promise, but you got to discover the generational promise over your family's life. What's the promise? Somebody say promise. promise. Sometimes that promise is aided by a prophecy, which means God sends somebody who prophetically declares a word over you and reminds you of a promise. But don't live being dependent on a prophet. Yes. That's right. Oh God. Yes. Don't live being dependent on a prophecy. What do you mean, preacher? Amen, praise God. Amen. The woman of Zarephath lived. Amen, praise God, being dependent on a prophet to show up at her house. Uh, but you may get get a prophet to your house. You will have to learn how to discover the word of God for yourself, over yourself, and your family tree. I wish I had about three year old praises in there. I'm almost done. Amen. Here's my overtime. Amen. Praise God. There are six elements. I'll probably only get to these three. But I want to say this. Amen. There is a prophecy uh, in the form of a promise. There's a promise and sometimes it comes in the form of a prophecy. Sometimes it comes in the form of a word. But what God does is that he then reveals a plan. Prophecy without plan is inspiration without execution. Yes. Yes. So you not only need a prophet and a prophecy. I got words that have been prophesied over my life. That's all good, but I want a fulfillment. Yeah. I want to walk in the manifestation. Yeah. And so I have spent last year learning and studying how to make prophecy a reality. Yeah. I go through pages of scripture because I was tired of inspiration without manifestation. Some of the people who prophesied on me are died, have died and gone on home to be there. And I'm still yet to see the manifestation. Amen. I don't want to be living on something they said. Right. Yeah. I want to know thus said the Lord over my life. Do I have a witness in the side? So God, in the second stage of vision, he gives you a plan. Because you can't live just on inspiration. You will have to put some perspiration to your inspiration. Yeah. 
I wish I had somebody in here. So he lays out a plan, and that plan is drawn, architecturally designed, on the canvas of your imagination. And so for some of us, we have seared our imagination with reality. We have, we have, we have, we have, we have told ourselves some things that's poisoning our imagination. Oh Lord, have mercy. The Bible says that the man of the in their heart. So are they. Your life follows your heart. Yes. I was driving here and there was there was there was an accident on the express when we had to drive through Germantown. And I had to go around, you know, Lincoln Drive just to get to church. And I, I was uh, accompanying the car in and praise God uh, by Shanti who had to be here to usher. And she said, I said to her, I said, I said, I, I remember uh, living in that high-rise apartment. Amen for that. That was my first apartment. I spent one year of my life in an apartment, and that was it. That high-rise apartment. And I said, I said, I felt like I had arrived. I was almost on the top floor. What am I telling you that? Amen. As I was driving by, and I said to myself, what in the world was I thinking? What in the world? And you know, I knew I was in trouble because I asked for the top floor because I felt like, you know, like George Jefferson, I finally got a piece of the pie, you know. <laughs> Amen, praise God. Put me on the top floor until I arrived one day and the power was out and I had to climb the steps all the way to the top floor and I realized that living at that high level has a cost. And she said to me, well, how long did you rent for? I said, well, uh, next year I bought a house. Amen. I said, I was 21 years old, I bought a house. I'm telling you my story, because it's real to me. Yes. And, I'm, and I said, I was 21 years old, I signed on a loan, biggest loan I ever signed for in my life. Amen, praise God. Lots of emotions, I was, my hands were shaking, my knees were knocking, but I still signed. Why? Because I had a vision of my future. Yes. I was 21 years old, a homeowner. I didn't know anybody that's my age who had recently come from the islands, even in prison, or gone home at 21. I didn't know, but my life was not somebody else's. My life was directed by my God was showing me and telling me and directing me. I'm coming this year to raise up a people that we've got to discover the plan that God has for our life. And it may not look like anybody else's life, but it's okay. You're not here, even praise God, to compete with somebody else. You're here to live out your best life according to what God has shown you. I learned this as a young boy, 2021. You gotta participate in your vision. Yes. Yes. You gotta participate in your vision. And I won't get the time this morning to really dissect the rest of these slides and I can close on this one. You're gonna have to participate. And you see a vision in the next few slides says a vision is a picture of the future. So compelling. Made real, oh thank you, see you're working with me, I feel good on it. Made real in your imagination, which is your thought life, yes. through the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. It is so real and so forceful that it has the power to shift your current reality. Amen. What God is trying to do today is not just inspire you for vision, mm. but he's trying to overtake your thought life so that he can make real in your imagination, a vision of your future. Yes. Let me say this. There are, there are eight key elements to everybody's life. Eight key elements. Eight key elements. Uh, help me, help me side to side. Let's go right to that side real quick because I'm close. Eight key elements, all right? They're spiritual. They are so, they're social. There's family and friends. Health and wellness. Love and intimacy. Financial independence and career advancement. Yes. Listen, I want to pause. I'm just going to leave that up there for those who were here yesterday. You recognize those eight elements. We briefly glanced over them on yesterday. But the truth of the matter is, the success of your life will depend on how much you focus on these key elements. Here's what I found sharing that room yesterday, sharing that experience with so many of you. I realize that I focus on individuals, sometimes one, maybe two. As a result, there's six other key elements of my life that I've left up to chance. I will no longer do that as a plan. I have been given a plan of God to work my life like it was a second job. Put your hands in here, please. Give me a second, give me a lot of time.